Okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm talking a little bit about multi-H, about what it is and about why we're considering it here at ESB. Um, as of right now, we've just been in the researching stage. We haven't actually gone and seen any multi-H classrooms or done it here at ESB. So this is a lot of research-based material. So we'll start with what is a multi-H classroom. And a simple working definition is just that it's the intentional blending of students of multiple ages and ability levels to create a community of learners. And that can be based on interest, ability, natural partnerships, rather than the chronological age that so often we're held down to. Which is what happens naturally in all sorts of situations and experiences as an adult. This is not my gymnastics team, but it could have been. I was one of these younger girls, and I remember joining the team thinking, whew, I am not ready to be around these girls that are 15, 16, and have been doing gymnastics way longer than me. But as a gymnast, it was really motivating. We may have been working on the same skills, but I would be noticing that some other girls could be doing it with their toes pointed, or some other girls could be sticking it right away. And it's really that leadership quality that helps you improve without necessarily any direct instruction. Just like how it happens in nature. A lot of animals with low birth rates, like gorillas, have their young in, infiltrate into the community through kind of a multi-age experience. The older youth gorillas teach the younger gorillas the expectations of the society, and it's really a natural process. As the children get older, they learn to then be the leader as they carry on into adulthood. As the children are younger, they play and follow the playful acts of the other younger children. So it's kind of a very natural progression from novice to expert, if you will. Why are people considering the multi-age? <laughs> I'm here. Um, some of the some of the reasons that people have considered and are considering multi-age now have to do with the flexibility in grouping, according to need, ability, interest, and not just by the age. Also, the student-parent-teacher relationship develops over time. Because in a multi-age classroom, you are with the same group of learners, the same teacher or teachers, and the same parents for a longer period of time. So you really skip that getting to know you phase in the next year and you really just hit the ground running. Um, it's a more natural learning situation, and the children can learn at their own pace, and it's not geared towards a single year of benchmarks. It can be adjusted over two or three years. So you know if a student is lacking something at the end of year one, you're really going to hit that area year two, or et cetera. Um, the benefits for older children include a quality of leadership and responsibility that they don't get developed among their same age peers as deeply. And younger children are stimulated intellectually as well as their behavior by the older children. They're exposed to things that they wouldn't be exposed to in that single age class. They have a broader social experience with more opportunity to lead and follow, collaborate, and develop stable peer relationships over a longer period of time. Some research suggests that it also alleviates some patterns of aggression in competition because it's a more natural situation in that people realize they're all going to be at different places and they're all going to be working at all sorts of different levels for different things rather than being in that similar, that similar age thing where you're comparing, I'm reading a level J and Joe is reading a level K or L and I really want to get there. When you know that you're working with a variety of learners, it alleviates some of that. There's a greater sense of community because you are with this same core group for a longer period of time. And you know that you're going to be responsible for taking on several roles throughout your time with that group. And um, it's really, in the end, it's the practice of teaching children of different ages and abilities and allowing students to progress at their own pace without dividing into lockstep patterns that need to be met at the end of each year. <coughs> And because what's most important about students is not their date of manufacture. I'm going to show a quick clip. I'm going to turn down the volume now. <laughs> Modeled on the interests of industrialism and in the image of it. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, schools are still pretty much organized on factory lines, you know, ringing bells, separate facilities. Uh, specialized into separate subjects. Um, we still educate children by batches. You know, we put them through the system by age group. Why do we do that? You know, why is there this assumption that the most important thing kids have in common is how old they are? 
You know, it's like the most important thing about them is their date of manufacture. I mean, well, I know kids who are much better than other kids at the same age in different disciplines, you know, or at different times of the day, or better in smaller groups than in large groups, or sometimes they want to be on their own. If you're interested in the model of learning, you don't start from this production line mentality. These are, it's essentially about conformity, and increasingly it's about that as you look at the growth of standardized testing and standardized curricula, and it's about standardization. I believe we've got to go in the exact opposite direction. That's what I mean about. So, a lot of times we prioritize something that, when you think about it, is really silly to put at the priority. And here's what some students are saying about it. These students are in a Montessori school <coughs> that goes from um, preschool to high school. And Montessori is a little bit different than what we're talking about here, but they do implement the multi age program. I've been in Montessori since preschool. I started at Sands Montessori and then came to Clark in seventh grade. I really liked being with people in other grade levels than me in early Montessori. Being in the three grade level classroom was both enjoyable and a good learning experience. Oh, when I was a first grader, I really enjoyed looking up to you know the third graders in my class because it was just really cool to see, you know, actual leaders and stuff. And I'm like, oh, you know, older people are talking about me. So, you know, kind of increased my self-esteem, you know, and it, it helped me to aspire to be a leader. And then when I was in third grade and, you know, talking to the first graders, it was, it was easy for me to, you know, be that example for, you know, the first graders. I grew up with the big third graders, and then I grew up being the third grader, and then there were the, the little first graders, and then I was a sixth grader, and I had lunch with the first graders, and I worked in project groups with fourth graders. and. And that really teaches you, and I think it crosses over also back into stereotypes that we have of each other, gender role, socioeconomic, race, that idea that, okay, so first I'm a sixth grader and I think, oh, that's just a fourth grader, and then I get to know them. And then I figure out that they haven't figured some things out, but they actually have a handle on things that I never would have thought of, even though I'm a sixth grader. When you're younger, you have older kids helping you out, and you get to know people that way. And it makes you almost more secure about yourself. Class friendships now with people that have interact with people who are older than me, which I wouldn't normally have if I was just in the class with first graders. And then when I'm, I look forward to that when I was in third grade, or when I'm third grade, I get to help the first grade with the reading and I can do this stuff. So it makes you almost like the sense of accomplishment as you go on to reach back and help everybody else. And most people say, oh, well, at the, the third grade level, students should be able to do this. And at the fourth grade level, students should be able to do this. And it's really funny because I learned with first, second, and third graders, and I still did really well on all those tests, and we all did really well, and there was no problem with that. I've seen the bottom of it. So again, you can even hear in, in the students talking about it, they really do have this sense of first looking up to the person and then becoming the person that's looked up to. And it's a really unique situation that a lot of kids in the single age never really get to experience. They either are consistently at the top of their class or possibly consistently at the bottom of their class. There's not really a whole lot of movement for them. They're stuck in that role. So how we've been doing this is we've again been doing a lot of research in terms of what the findings are for different areas that would be applied to multi-age. Some of the research topics we've looked at are Implications for teaching and learning, and one of the big, biggest outcomes of that research is that teachers who consistently like structure and for things to be exactly the same way, we do workbook page one, we do workbook page two, we do workbook page three, really struggle with multi-age. They also say that differentiation, collaboration, hands-on learning, and teachers who have, um, who have enough planning time and enough support with training and resources really enjoy it. So it's Again, the, those strategies in teaching and what makes the difference. If it is a school where you know we follow a lockstep curriculum, it's really challenging. If it's a school where you have adequate plenty of time, you have the support, you have the resources, and you have the strategies that lend themselves to multi-age, there have been some really positive results. We've also been in contact with some sample programs. There is a huge difference. You can tell within reading the first three lines of a report if the school has chosen to do multi-age or if the school is required. The schools that are required to do multi-age are often required out of necessity because students are coming from far away, they don't have enough to form a grade level because there aren't enough teachers, there aren't enough resources, and 
oftentimes in those scenarios it does fail because there's too wide of a gap, that there's not enough resources, that the teacher doesn't have adequate time. But when the school makes a conscious decision to implement multi-age, oftentimes it proves successful. So that's what we've really been talking to in terms of our communications. I've been talking to a few schools. Also, it's interesting talking to some of the schools that do PYP, how they incorporate PYP in, into the multi-age. Some of the cognitive effects are about nil. It's, it hasn't proven that there are really strong cognitive effects, but it also hasn't proven that they're negative. Um, some studies do show a small advantage, but not enough to, to claim that the multi-age program would have cognitive advantages. So if, again, if you're implementing a multi-age classroom to get higher test scores, you're probably not going to achieve what you're looking for. Um, it doesn't show any harm in academics, but it's not something that's really going to bump up any test scores. On the flip side, the social emotional effects are very positive. Often students who are a part of a multi-age classroom have a higher self-esteem, a more positive self-image, and are better able to collaborate with peers. Again, that has to do with that limiting the, uh, the competition and aggress aggressive behaviors and working together as a community and realizing that I'm going to play different roles in this community throughout my time here, but that that's okay and I accept my roles and I accept the roles of the other students that I'm with. Um, another big piece is the family and community. This is another area that has a lot of really positive results. The family tends to typically really enjoy the multi-age program because the teachers and parents and children really stick together for a longer period of time to make that relationship deeper and more meaningful. Often, um, the, now that the number of children in a family is going down, it shows that having children have those interactions with a wider variety of age levels can be really valuable for them developing a broader social base as they go on. So these are some of the members of the task force. Two of them are here in the corner. So if you see them, they, they can tell you more as well. Otherwise, any questions from you? Sure. I'm curious. Uh, you, you you mentioned, and the uh, and the video also mentioned the implementation of, of these multi age groups in uh, with younger students in in the primary school in particular. Have you seen many uh, many efforts to implement it at uh, say the middle school level or um, anywhere question. else? There aren't nearly as many as much research regards to uh, middle school and above. However, there have been some that show a. Um, there's a book called. Uh, I want to say the story of Alpha is what it's called, and it's the story of Alpha: 33 years of multi-age in a middle school. And um, some of the middle schools that have done it in particular have found it to be very powerful. Um, some do it as a whole middle school, some do it as just a section of the middle school. And um, it's interesting when they compare having done it with just a section of the middle school to the kids who stayed in the single lockstep. The middle school that did it as a multi-age, one section and single age, the other section, the students in the multi-age really had a more positive view about not only each other but about school and really wanted to carry it on in the high school. And so they came up with their own transition program for the students leaving the multi-age, entering the high school. The students leaving the multi-age set up the transition program for the other students that are coming out, which was, you know, great student initiative on their own part. Can, can I follow up that just real quick? You, you, you mentioned the uh, emotional and... Uh, and, and, and social factors showing an, an increase. Do you know? Did, did they? Uh, do, do you know how they measured those, or was it just through interviews, typically? Or, or I'm gonna I'm gonna hand off to Jeff. Do you, do you remember any of how they measured that? There was some qualitative, uh, but most of them were quantitative, and they were measures of self-esteem, and then also anecdotal report about how the children got along together and teacher report back. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's quite a bit of literature out there mm -hmm. for youngest. Sure. I'm fascinated by this. I, I, we do it partially in our electives at our school, of course we have multi-age things. And there has been a study, um, Los Angeles University Berkeley, the Berkeley did one over a two-year period, and showed that um, uh, vertical tutor groups especially mm. modified the whole behavior of the school. Mm. And I'm fascinated by the opportunities for younger kids to learn citizenship skills. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a great idea. I mean, I want to be open <coughs> to it. And I think one of the obvious areas to have this is in the peer, in the vertical tutor, tutoring structure in the school. Absolutely. Um, and, and there's lots of opportunities for peer tutoring, 
and the um, idea that younger kids lose their fear of older kids. Absolutely. And I think it's a great idea. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yesterday in the session um, that Craig did, he talked about how you have the research and development on one side and the teaching and learning. Can you share how your cohorts that are doing the teaching and learning side, how do those two pieces of information come together? Or what's there, the kind of the difference in what you're doing? As this, since this is year one, mm -hmm. a lot of what, of what we've been working on has been separate at this point. Only because what we're working on in the R&D team yep. is more of these like big ideas for the future. Okay. And what the teaching and learning team is working on is what's currently happening in okay, our school Okay, so they're not the same. Okay, got it. So that's been a little bit different. Now, if some of these things that we're talking about in research and development do begin to get implemented, then we'll need to start coordinating more with the teaching and learning team. Okay, got it. So what, what is your next step from here? Well, our next step is we have drafted our report of recommendations, and now we present that to the leadership team, and leadership team decides in what capacity, if any, we would like to prototype. And you know that it, so that'll really be in their hands. As teachers, we've done our job. Now it's up to them. <laughs> I taught at a uh, in a six seven class and a seven eight class, uh, and that was uh, it was good in a lot of ways, but it was a lot of work. How do you uh, how do you see that with three age levels? Absolutely. One of the interesting pieces is that some schools who teach multi age find that teaching with co-teachers is really helpful, which, as you mentioned, what are we doing now? That was a little piece of our report, is that we do recommend there being two teachers, because that really gives the teachers the extra planning time and the extra collaborative you know, mind to really do work that flexible grouping that is so much a part of what makes this successful. Because if you don't have the manpower or the time to really plan those groups and to really do that effectively, then it does become really strenuous and really stressful. So having that planning time and having what we recommend, having that partnership, really helps alleviate some of that extra work. And you would do three levels? Yeah. That's, so the research said that the best age grouping where students receive the most of the benefits, those social benefits and some of the other benefits that I mentioned, where when you have a three-year span where the average gap is two-year difference, so like six, seven, and eight, the six and eight-year-olds have a two-year difference. Hi. You mentioned several ways to determine everything. Mm. Yeah. Have you made any recommendations or that be based on? I think one thing in the grouping is that it's constantly changing. So at one point you may be grouping by ability for reading, and you may be working at a really tight reading group that's reading around the same level. But the next day you may be working on something in inquiry where it's really based on interest, where we're studying earth forces and these kids are all interested in tsunamis. But before you even, within the classroom, how do you determine the classes themselves? Ah, what, what selection criteria for the multi age. Yes. So we kind of recommend that it's not a tracking sort of deal where you don't pick the highest of one grade level because then they'll be working with these kids because eventually that's going to fail. When those kids get to the top then they're going to want to, it's not really effective for them anymore if they were already at the top. So you really want it to be a natural spread of learners just like you would put together for any class. You know, you want to balance that boy-girl ratio, the EAL level, and all those things. You still want to take those into account when lending a multi-age classroom. So would you implement so, it? Sorry, yep. Sorry. <laughs> In a school, would you have like a one, two, and three together, and the two, three, four together, three, four, five? It's interesting. A lot of schools have a lot of different takes on that. Some just have, you know, this is our one multi-age, and then once you're done with that, you're done. But several do have multi-age, particularly from K to six almost. So there would be like a K one two, and then three, four, five, or four, five, six. And so, you know, it depends how they break it up. But oftentimes it carries right on through to that five, six level. And um, again, it, it really depends what the school wants to implement, but they, it has shown some value in continuing that because that sense of community just kind of grows greater and greater. The leadership <coughs> skills really are brought out by that continual progress. And follow on, does the kids still spend like six years before you implement this and then six years at school after you implement this? Or are you actually thinking towards some kids can get out earlier? Oh, oh. middle school. So you're saying like, if they are, if they've achieved the goals of the program, can they exit early? Yeah. Mm. That's a really interesting question. And my personal take on that would be yes. However, you know, it really again it varies school by school. But um, again, if you have a kid that's met all the benchmarks by year four, why make them do year five? Um, so you know, it would again depend on what your school believes and 
how that works for your school. Mm -hmm. The PYP thing. Um, which mean, if you're doing for three years, obviously we should do like different units and quite over the three years. Yeah, you exactly. Like revisit. A, a lot of schools that implement multi-age have a cycle program where it's not, you know, we do this every spring, we do this every fall, we do this every, because that won't work. So they do a cycle year one, these are our units, cycle year two, these are our units, and cycle year three, these are our units, which is part of the reason why it's really important that the students are really there from year one through year three, because otherwise they might miss gaps in that program. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Thank you.